Um, consciousness might have evolved to give us knowledge of the world or knowledge of um, ourselves or certain kinds of inference um, or certain kinds of learning uh, or to give us voluntary action, voluntary control over our, our own actions uh, or maybe self-representation. These are things you can find in the literature as uh, possible biological functions of consciousness, things that consciousness evolved for. Um, and uh, it all sounds relatively plausible until we introduce a uh, distinction that uh, is also somewhat contentious, but um, it's very helpful in this context. And that's the distinction that Bloch calls phenomenal consciousness, net Bloch versus access consciousness. Um, this is terminology, but the, the distinction is pretty straightforward and, and predates net Bloch. Um, and it's the distinction between the qualitative aspect of experience, um, the redness of a red experience, for example, or the blue versus the blueness of, a, of an experience of blue, um, or sometimes some people call it what it's like, what it's like to have a certain experience, versus um, awareness as in the uh, availability of a mental state to ourselves, the ability to uh, report a mental state, that mental state might be called conscious when we can report on it, or when we can use it to guide our actions, when it's, uh, uh, it directs action in a certain way. Um, so when we talk about access consciousness, the availability of certain mental representations to a guiding action and uh, maybe uh, including uh, first-person reports, uh, I don't see any problem, any difficulty in attributing functions to consciousness in this sense. Uh, and presumably, a lot of our states that are access conscious um, or a lot of the, um, the processes that are access conscious that give rise to uh, states that are access conscious have evolved uh, for lots of purposes, right? And so, uh, for example, perception evolved to give us knowledge of the world. And uh, inferential processes uh, evolved to extract more knowledge uh, about the world or about people, about other creatures, uh, from what we can uh, learn from our senses. And, of course, motor control has evolved to guide our actions. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. You know, theory of mind evolved to give us knowledge of other minds. Um, so there's no question that access consciousness uh, has functions, biological functions, and it was selected for uh, for various functions that it has. Uh, at least that's, I think, overwhelmingly plausible. Uh, the, 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 the question, though, that I'm uh, interested in today is, what about phenomenal consciousness? So one way to put it is, why should these mental states uh, that, have, that are access conscious, that have evolved for various purposes, why should they be uh, also accompanied by this qualitative feel? Why should they feel like anything? Um, does that have any function or any biological function, any adaptive value uh, such that it would be selected for. Uh, that's the topic. So the topic is whether phenomenal consciousness has any function. Um, and so, whereas assigning functions to access consciousness is relatively easy, as I was saying, assigning functions to phenomenal consciousness is not so easy. And in fact, uh, none of the stories that are in the literature seems very compelling, at least on the face of it. Because, well, there's two, at least, initial reasons. Many mental functions can be performed without phenomenal consciousness. Uh, we certainly have heard a lot about that uh, in this uh, summer institute. Um, for example, um, Hakon Lao yesterday was pointing out how if you look carefully enough, you will probably find a way to um, 
uh, initiate any particular mental process uh, unconsciously, without phenomenal consciousness. Although he didn't really distinguish uh, explicitly between phenomenal and access consciousness, he might even have meant without access consciousness, or at least without the most high-level type of access consciousness, such that you can report on the presence of a mental state. But certainly, um, we know from examples like blindsight that we can perform any mental functions without phenomenal consciousness. And, and you know, the cognitive unconscious is by now a commonplace. We know a lot of what we do constantly happens unconsciously. Um, plus, uh, we have now uh, sophisticated computers and robots that can perform many of our mental functions without seemingly having any phenomenal consciousness. Uh, so by extension, from these sets of examples, we might wonder, could we have a, a system, either natural or artificial, that can do everything we can do, every mental function we can perform, without phenomenal consciousness? Okay, and now at this point, we need to introduce a uh, somewhat technical notion from um, evolutionary theory, that's the notion of a spandrel, um, or an evolutionary accident. Those are two sl slightly different notions, but related. And these are notions of a trait or some aspect of a, uh, a biological system that uh, is present even though it was not selected for. Okay, so here is a, um, a picture of the human eye, or the ver which is an example of a vertebrate eye, the eye of a vertebrate. And uh, as you know, we have a blind spot because um, there's a hole in the retina. Why is there a hole in the retina? Uh, there's, this is not something that was selected for, or at least we don't think so. There is a hole in the retina because um, the axons coming out of the retina uh, which need to reach the uh, thalamus and then from the thalamus they, you know, the thalamus projects to the visual cortex and so forth. So the axons from the retina um, are pointed inward instead of outward. Now in, uh, you know, in squids and octopuses they're pointing outward and so squids and, and octopuses they don't have a blind spot. But vertebrates do have a blind spot. Um, most likely, at least, you know, the common uh, view about this is that it was an accident. In the vertebrate evolution, somehow, for whatever reason, axons ended up pointing inward. In order to exit the eye, they needed a place to exit, so um, there's a hole in the retina because of that. So the hole in the retina is a spandrel. A spandrel meaning a byproduct of some other trait. In this case, the other trait is itself an evolutionary accident. It's the fact that the axons coming out of the retina are pointing towards the eye instead of away from the eye. So this example illustrates both spandrels and evolutionary accidents. Um, a spandrel is a byproduct of something else um, that has no reason of its own to exist, it was not selected for, and an accident is also something that was not selected for. It just happens to be that way. Okay, so one common, one common source of accidents is genetic drift. Okay, so if two variants of a gene have no um, relative advantage, and neither one of them, neither one of them is uh, favored by um, selective pressures, it may well be that over time one of them accidentally, by random genetic drift, it um, takes over, and the other one just disappears. It, it was not that, it's not that the one that survived was selected for, it's just that the other one um, drifts away. And so, you know, you're left with one, but it doesn't mean that it was better than the other, or more uh, adaptive than the other. So the question now is, could phenomenal consciousness be either a spandrel, an evolutionary byproduct of something else, or an accident. Um, by accident, I mean without a function, without a, bi a biological function or an adaptive function. Um, and then more, uh, a related question is, 
Um, could consciences be either adaptively neutral, meaning it makes no difference for the purposes of natural selection and adaptation, or even somewhat detrimental? Okay, so in the example of the eye, um, the fact that the axons point inward arguably decreases visual acuity a little bit. If we didn't have the axons in the way, we might be able to detect uh, light a little bit better um, and see a little bit better. Probably not a big difference. Small enough that it was not worth selecting against. Um, the blind spot could be potentially detrimental a little bit, at least in some special circumstances. But, you know, the brain has evolved the ability to fill in and guess what's there. Plus, we have binocular vision, so as long as we have both eyes, um, we can use the other eye to um, compensate. But, you know, in principle, you know, if we lose one eye and circumstances are a little tricky, we might uh, have, you know, we might have a, uh, um, face some problems or um, be harmed by the presence of a blind spot. In principle, like, uh, clearly it was not a, a big deal. We've survived and vertebrates have survived pretty well in spite of the blind spot. But it, the point is that it certainly doesn't help and it could be a little bit detrimental. Okay. Um, so before we proceed, there may, there may be a couple of things to say. So we can't just, especially you know, when we talk about evolutionary theory, uh, it's a speculative uh, enterprise, we should try to be a little bit careful, a little bit constrained. Um, what are some constraints? Well, one, one obvious constraint is there shouldn't be uh, any kind of obvious or even very plausible story about how the trait in question uh, has evolved and the mechanism by which it's produced, um, such that it has a, uh, an adaptive function before we conclude that it may be a spandrel or an accident, okay? In the case of phenomenal consciousness, there isn't any such uh, compelling story. There is no compelling story to the effect that phenomenal consciousness has a particular biological function and is generated by a certain mechanism um, that would be uh, um, selected for. So in this respect, it's a, at least a potential candidate for this hypothesis that it's a spandrel or an accident. Um, spandrels cannot be maladaptive in the sense of uh, leading to being selected against or being be, the traits that they're byproduct of being selected against. Um, so there's two different kinds of byproducts. One is a necessary consequence of a certain trait, the other one is an accidental consequence of a certain trait. Uh, if it's a necessary consequence, meaning that trait could not be there without having those consequences, for example, the blind spot is a necessary consequence of, presumably, of the wiring of the oxen coming into the eye. They have to get out somehow, so they, they need a hole from which they get out. I guess, you know, the hole could be in a, in a place where there's no retina there, but um, um, if the retina covered the whole eye, let's say, then it would be a necessary consequence. If the retina doesn't cover the whole eye, it's an accidental consequence. Okay, so if it's necessary, it can be a little bit dysfunctional. Um, so long as the adaptive value of the trait that it's a byproduct of um, trumps this um, dysfunctionality, right? So the trace itself, you know, having a well-functioning eye um, is so much more adaptive, so much more valuable to the organism than um, the degree to which the blind spot is dysfunctional that um, it doesn't lead to selection against the trait. Um, if it's not necessary, then it, it cannot be dysfunctional because uh, if it's really not necessary, that it could be selected against on its own and, uh, and just eliminated that way. If it's just uh, 
kind of tacked on. Uh, but either way, it cannot be maladapted. It cannot be maladapted in the sense that it leads to, say, selection against the trade itself, against like, having an eye. Um, and there's no evidence that phenomenal consciousness is maladaptive in that sense. It's been around for a long time, probably. Um, and in fact, there are plenty of people who argue that it is adaptive. It's just that they don't seem to have a very um, compelling story for uh, what it was selected for. OK. So in a, based on this um, constraint, consciousness remains a phenomenal consciousness remains a decent candidate for the hypothesis that it's a spandrel or a, an evolutionary accident. One more um, question, maybe the biggest question is, well, what is it a consequence of? What is it a, a uh, byproduct of? Uh, it may be a byproduct of the organizational complexity of the brain. At least that's uh, maybe what um, seems to me the most obvious possibility. So uh, there are two options. Uh, one is that I thought of. One is that um, enough tightly coupled components, enough tightly coupled neurons, a system that, that includes enough of these um, processors that are working together in specific ways, uh, maybe by natural law, gives rise to phenomenal consciousness. I'm not saying this is especially illuminating, but it's just kind of one thought about um, what phenomenal consciousness might be a byproduct of. It just happens to come along for free every time you have this kind of tightly coupled system of processing units. Another possibility would be when you process uh, information a certain way, when a system processes information um, in a sufficiently powerful way, in such and such ways, then you kind of automatically, by natural law, for free, so to speak, get phenomenal consciousness. By for free, I mean you don't need to select for uh, the presence of phenomenal consciousness. It just happens to come along when you have this kind of information processing. Um, OK, so uh, those are some uh, thoughts about the kinds of traits that would be selected for you know, either information processing or a uh, tightly coupled system of uh, processing units, um, and what uh, phenomenal consciousness might be a byproduct of. Or it might be an accidental correlation with, if it's an accident. OK. so. Um, the, the best objection that I, that I uh, have found to this uh, hypothesis is that um, there are these cases where, uh, the, these, these cases are called petit mal epileptic seizures. Apparently there are these situations in which uh, people uh, subject to certain kinds of epileptic seizures, they lose phenomenal consciousness. So. When, when they come out of it, they will report that they were not conscious of anything. They, they had no experience, they know how phenomenal experience while they were undergoing these seizures, which fits with other evidence about epileptic seizures where people lose consciousness. But unlike normal epileptic seizures where people become totally dysfunctional, these people, they keep uh, behaving in an almost normal way. From the outside, it looks like they are, they are functioning normally or almost normally. Except that when you look closely, so they might continue, you know, they might be driving, instead of crashing into something, they keep driving. And they might be playing the, an instrument, and instead of dropping the instrument or, or dropping themselves on the ground the way people subject to other kinds of epileptic seizures do, they will continue playing. Um, but then they will stop at the end of the piece. Or, you know, they will stop when they drive home, they, they stop when they reach home, and then they will just kind of freeze there. Because they can only continue engaging in uh, autom automated behavior, um, but they don't seem to be able to make uh, any kind of interesting decisions or plans or do anything novel or creative. So then this suggests that, yes, to some extent, it's it's possible to behave in the absence of phenomenal consciousness. It's possible to do a lot of very sophisticated things in the absence of phenomenal consciousness, which 
to some extent corroborates this hypothesis that phenomenal consciousness is really uh, a byproduct of something else that has no biological function of its own, except that something is missing, and that is genuine autonomy or uh, creative behavior, the ability to make choices. Uh, so that suggests that maybe that is the biological function of phenomenal consciousness or something along those lines, okay? So if this is a, uh, a good indication of what phenomenal consciousness adds to normal cognition, namely it gives us a kind of flexibility that we would lack otherwise, then, you know, we might have stumbled on the biological function of consciousness, of phenomenal consciousness. Um, but, of course, there is another possibility, and the other possibility is that perhaps these particular conditions, patima epileptic seizures, affect both phenomenal consciousness and the brain's ability to integrate information so as to make decisions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, it may be that these condi this condition either is the common cause of the loss of both, loss of both phenomenal consciousness and uh, flexibility in behavior, let's say, or maybe there is a common cause to both and this epileptic uh, seizures affect that or, or you know, trigger this common cause. Um, the point of this is just to say um, this objection is not a knockdown objection. Um, it remains to be investigated further. Uh, whether there's any compelling <coughs> evidence for a uh, biological function of phenomenal consciousness. And if there isn't, the, the possibility that it's a spandrel that is a byproduct of something else or an accident it remains in place. Okay. Now, um, this completes the first part of the talk in which I've introduced the hypothesis that phenomenal consciousness is uh, either a byproduct of something else or an evolutionary accident without its own biological functions. Now, I'm going to spend a, a little bit of time discussing. Um, the relationship between this hypothesis, the, span, the accident or byproduct hypothesis, and the metaphysics of mind. Um, because there are very interesting interconnections between the two, such that, uh, for example, several views about the metaphysics of mind, the metaphysics of phenomenal consciousness, um, virtually entail the hypothesis that phenomenal consciousness is either a byproduct or a uh, accident, and therefore refuting this hypothesis, refuting the hypothesis that uh, phenomenal consciousness is a byproduct or a, an evolutionary accident, would also refute certain views about the metaphysics of mind, which you know I find to be an interesting um, discovery, so to speak. Um, and one way to get there is to discuss, or you know, remind you of philosophical zombies. These are um, thought experiments uh, that have been discussed heavily in the philosophical literature, especially over the last 15 years or so. The, mo the best known kind is the number one, the non-conscious physical duplicate. This is supposed to be a molecule, molecule by molecule uh, duplicate of you, um, except the only difference, so he does everything you do, or she does everything you do, um, behaves exactly the same way. You know, EEG recordings are the same, brain scans all show the same activity, except the zombie has no phenomenal consciousness. Okay? This kind of zombie, if it's possible, it entails a kind of property dualism about phenomenal consciousness. Um, there is another kind of uh, zombie that was discussed more in the 80s, um, it wasn't called a zombie, but it can be called a zombie. It's the non-conscious functional duplicate. It's physically different, so it's not going to give the same readings on a, on a brain scan device or on an EEG. It may not even 
give any EEG readings because it may be, it may have a silicon-based uh, circuit inside instead of a uh, carbon-based uh, brain. Um, but it's functionally equivalent. It behaves exactly the way that you do. And if this is correct, well, it also entails a kind of property dualism about phenomenal consciousness, if this is possible. So it's possible to, to have a zombie like that. Um, now, there is another kind of zombie that's not been discussed in the literature. Um, uh, we are introducing it here for our purposes. It's number three here. It's a non-conscious duplicate of all the biologically adapted functions. So this is a, uh, this is a kind of a system that behaves the same way that you do with respect to anything that's uh, relevant to uh, evolutionary process, select, selection, uh, evolution by natural selection. Um, so anything that's biologically adaptive, this creature will do the same way that you do, but it may not do some other things that are not adaptive, or that they're either neutral or detrimental. So suppose that, I don't know, phenomenal consciousness is the one thing that makes you, uh, disp disposes you to be becoming addicted to heroin. And suppose that becoming addicted to heroin is maladaptive, or at any rate, it's dysfunctional. It's not, it's, it has nothing to do with anything that was selected for. Well, this kind of zombie would not be disposed to um, becoming addicted to heroin. So it would have a behavioral difference from you, okay? So it's a different kind of zombie because all the other zombies, the number one, number two, they are behaviorally equivalent. They behave exactly the way you do. The third one may, may have some behavioral differences, okay? May, may behave just the way you do in all kinds of circumstances except you give him heroin or you give her heroin and she will not become addictive. That's an example. I mean, this is a kind of a silly example, but hopefully it, it, it illustrates the point. Um, and therefore, the third kind of zombie does not, even if it's possible, it does not entail property dualism. Okay? So this, I'm, I'm certainly not trying to promote property dualism. In fact, I don't like property dualism at all. Um, and uh, part of the point here is that we don't need to uh, endorse property dualism if this uh, hypothesis is correct. I think I have, what, another five minutes? Ten? Ten. Okay. Okay, so the reason I stress all of this is that sometimes this hypothesis that phenomenal consciousness is... Uh, is an accident or, or a byproduct is confused with epiphenomenalism. Epiphenomenalism says that phenomenal consciousness is inert, is causally inert, has no effects. But that's not what I'm saying, okay? That's not what this hypothesis is. So this is an argument from epiphenomenalism to the view that consciousness is either a spandrel or an evolutionary accident. So the epiphenomenalist is committed to this view but this view is not committed to epiphenomenalism, all right? The reason why epiphenomenalism is committed is because number two is a, is a uh, um, I would say, unproblematic uh, premise to be added to epiphenomenalism. It's a premise that causally inert properties cannot be selected for. Since they don't have any effect, natural selection cannot uh, select for them. You know, natural selection is a natural causal process that has to uh, select for something based on the effects that it has. Um, so, epiphenomenalism, so anybody who's an epiphenomenalist should like this hypothesis very much because it gets them off the hook with respect to how did it originate through evolution. Well, it originated this way, not because it was selected for. Property dualism, um, which is consistent with uh, epiphenomenalism, but it's not exactly the same view either, also um, ends up committed to this view. Why? Because paradigm is the view that conscious is a non-physical property. Um, I think it's plausible to uh, add premise two, and there is an argument for that. Namely, non-physical properties are physically inert. And then premise three, the same, approximately the same as the premise two in the previous argument, 
physically inner properties cannot be selected for because they don't have any impact on the kinds of processes that natural selection um, <coughs> interacts with. So therefore, consciousness is either a spandrel or a volitional accident. Um, again, though, this view, the view that I'm discussing, does not entail property dualism. This is an advantage, too, because if you don't like property dualism, you're not committed to it by just considering this hypothesis. Um, not only that, though, you know, remember what I, what I was saying about the metaphysics of the mind is, on one hand, if you have that kind of view, you're an epiphenomenalist, you're a property dualist, you need this hypothesis because it gets you off the hook. On the other hand, if you can refute this hypothesis, you're also refuting um, some um, views about the metaphysics of mind. You know? So you do modest tolerance. If this is wrong, then probably dualism is wrong. Now, what I didn't really justify is uh, premise two, that non-physical properties are physically inert. Not everybody will agree with that, but there is a argument um, called a causal exclusion argument that uh, has been uh, pushed very hard by a philosopher named Jegwon Kim. Um, and this is a version of this argument for property dualism. Since I don't have a huge amount of time left, I'm going to skip it. Uh, I'm just going to say it's a very plausible argument that says if um, if you start with non-physical properties, they're not needed for anything, for anything causal. Um, they end up being physically inert, okay? Because uh, you know the physical world is causally closed, meaning every physical effect has a sufficient physical cause, okay? Um, now there is another kind of causal exclusion argument that works for non-reductive physical. And non-reductive physical is another metaphysical view about the mind. Um, at least the, the formulation I'm gonna, uh, that I'm going to work with says um, that consciousness, this is the view about, all these views about, about, are about phenomenal consciousness specifically, okay? So non-reductive non -reductive physicalism about Phenomenal consciousness says phenomenal consciousness is a higher level physical property and higher level physical properties are distinct from fundamental physical properties. That's number one here. And you can run a causal exclusion argument for, from there to the conclusion that higher level physical properties are physically inert. Why? Because you already have fundamental physical properties that are doing the causing and you can dispense with these higher level physical causes. And if this is correct, and I think it's very plausible at any rate, then you have an argument from non-reductive physicalism to our, our good friend, the view that consciousness is either a byproduct of something else or an evolutionary accident. It works just the same way as the previous argument about uh, property dualism. It starts with non-reductive physicalism, that's, which says consciousness is a higher level physical property. Then it's, it introduces the conclusion of the causal exclusion argument. The, um, uh, you know, a higher level prop physical property is causally inert. Um, it, as our usual premise, physically inert properties cannot be selected for. And it generates the conclusion um, that we're discussing Again, therefore, a non-reductive physicalist should be very interested in this hypothesis, and anybody who can refute this hypothesis um, is going to also refute at least this version of non-reductive physicalism. Okay, functionalism. Functionalism is consistent with the hypothesis also. Functionalism often is formulated in terms of machines, Functionalism is the view that the nature of mental states is, is, um, is given by their functional relations or, the or some of their causal relations. And often it generates the, the intuition that phenomenal consciousness cannot really be re uh, explained in functional terms. Um, 
because any biological function performed by a conscious organism could have been performed by an unconscious organism. Um, you know, those, the, there's a famous, this, uh, probably the, the locus classicus of this is a paper by Ned Block, 1978, in which he has, you know, the Chinese nation, you know, everybody talking on their um, radios to implement a computer that simulates a mind, and then the intuition is that that's not conscious. Okay, so same deal here. Um, if, you, if you're a functionalist and you buy into this intuition, you restrict functionalism only to cognition and you leave final conscious out, you end up with this deal. Okay, final point is the spinal accident view is also compatible with reductive physicalism and other views about the metaphysics of mind. It's really consistent with any metaphysics of mind. Okay, so I'm not taking a stance here on the metaphysics of mind. Um, but there are these interesting connections such that if you can refute this view, you can rule out a whole range of options in the metaphysics of mind. Okay, so finally, consciousness, phenomenal consciousness may be a spandrel evolutionary accident. I'm not saying it is, but it may be. It's at least something we should consider, we should we should discuss as opposed to ignore. Um, there are some reasons in favor of this view, especially if you buy into certain metaphysics of mind, in, into certain metaphysical views about consciousness. And there's no uh, knockdown objection to it. And uh, it seems to me that keeping this in mind um, might help us with two things. One, to think carefully about the function of consciousness and the way it might have evolved. And two, the metaphysics of mind, which views are viable and which ones are not. That's it. Thank you. Okay, so now question.